All right, welcome back everybody. Michael Lofito here. Welcome to the 24th episode of Luxury Lunch and Learn. We launched this on April 10th uh, due to COVID-19, trying to get different perspectives to the industry. And we've had you know, top luxury agents, heads of lux luxury divisions, and I'm excited for today's guest, uh, industry expert, um, and really looking forward to uh, talking to Stefan. Just a couple of reminders, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, same time, same place, 1030 Pacific, 1230 Central, uh, right here streaming live to multiple Facebook groups as well as uh, on the Zoom account. Uh, Friday, we have a top agent out of Arizona on, and uh, next week we have some exciting guests as well. And then we're gonna do some recordings as I'm gonna be doing some traveling and we'll reconvene at the end of the month with the luxury lunch and learns that are live. So uh, without further ado, I wanna bring on today's guest. Um, I first uh, heard about C360 through a friend of mine uh, named Brian Colhane um, out of Arizona. And um, uh, Brian is a, a great guy, industry leader and uh, has a servant mentality. And he said, man, you gotta, you got to check these guys out. They provide some great content and they have an amazing event. So uh, with that being said, I went to an event last year in, uh, in San Diego and I was just blown away. And um, ever since then, I've been really just glued to all the content that you and your team are providing, oh. Stefan. So uh, Stefan, and I, I don't want to butcher your last name. How do I pronounce it? I want to make sure I do it right the first time. Swanapool. Swanapool, Stefan Swanapool, and uh, he's out of California, and he runs uh, an amazing company called T360, so welcome. Michael, thank you. You're a beast if you're doing it Monday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah. That's incredible, guy. That's 24 in the last, wow, eight weeks, nine weeks? Wow, yeah. excellent. Good job. Good job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just felt like, you know, especially, you know, the niche that I serve, the agents and the brokers looking to strengthen luxury divisions or launch, you know, leadership, right? Bring thought leaders together and how to pivot, how to adapt, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And that's why I brought you on today. I mean, you. you have your finger on multiple pulses as far as leadership to MLSs to real estate boards, but also, you know, brokerages, uh, you know, come to, to you guys. So t tell everybody a little bit about you and a little bit about your company and we'll start there, I guess. About me? Oh, boy. Uh, I'm just an average guy. I'm just another guy. <clears throat> uh, T3 is uh, an organization that we started um, officially 21, 22 years ago. We renamed it about five or six years ago, so the name sounds uh, maybe more recent than that. But, but the company is 21, 22 years old, and it was largely uh, built on the desire for me personally to have better information. Our industry, unfortunately, is not very good with information. We're not very consistent. We're a little bit over the board. There are many, many, many claims made by many organizations. We're an industry that is known for companies that like to say, I'm the first, I'm the only, I'm the best, I'm the number one. And I just got to a stage where I got tired of all of that. Dare I say on your call, um, I'll just call it BS, which I'll say is blue sky. Right. So all the blue sky that was thrown out there of claims and alleged. And I was looking for just good data and, and not data that benefited one guy above another, just, just fair, logical, clean, scrubbed, aggregate data. And um, that's what we basically are. We see ourselves as the, I don't know, the, the Forrester, the Gardner, the Wikipedia, the JD Powers, uh, the McKinsey of real estate. We, we don't do work outside of residential real estate. This is our niche. This is the niche I've always been in. I love the residential real estate. It's my home. It has been my entire life. This is my 38th year in real estate. Okay. So I will never, ever, ever go anywhere else. So T3 was born to provide uh, quality data, quality research, the analysis of trends and companies and shifts and changes, uh, new business models, what's important, and to provide it to largely the leadership. We It is, of course, available to agents, but you know, many times agents are so preoccupied in selling that they don't always... They don't always read what they're given, but, mm -hmm. but it is largely used by, by brokers, leaders, executives, managers, office managers, team leaders, company leaders, franchisees, franchisors, um, and we're totally a brand agnostic. We're, we don't uh, benefit or serve any one specific brand, and we have served thousands of companies, uh, but at any given time, we probably have about 150 or so clients, of which, you know, if you said... Uh, Realty would be 
an example of one client. Remax would be an example of one client. Mm -hmm. uh, NAR would be an example of one client. Zillow would be. So it's, it's not, it's brands, it's independents, it's franchises, it's associations. It's any player in the industry that wants to be um, ahead of the curve. Okay. Uh, that, and, you know, what better time with the curve, right? I mean, right now we're going through some turbulence, right? I call it explosions, uh, you know, big, big air pockets, if you will. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, that's something I want to talk to you about. But before I do that, just out of curiosity, the name, if you don't mind, what, what, <laughs> um, you know, T3, T360, you know, what, what the, went into the, the name? Yeah, the industry... Um, I, I believe that most people like to acronize and shorten and chop everything off. So if you, if you come up with a long name, it's, it's not memorable. Um, my last name is memorable because nobody knows how to spell it or pronounce it. <laughs> so, so because it's butchered so many times, I say, well, I'm not going to pick my name. I don't want to use my name. Sure. I'm trying to look for something which is, is more um, generic and short. And, you know, many companies are called real estate this or research this. So I wanted to stay away from the generic stuff. T3 comes from uh, the 360 is uh, full circle uh, with the entire industry. We, we try and look at everything from all points of view. We don't want to pick uh, the positive or the negative or the right or the wrong. We, don't, we, we want to look at all of the facts and give you all of the facts so that you can take, take a decision. And then the T3, uh, T originally stood for uh, trends, technology, and transformation. So it was my way of just saying that I believe that technology is a significant component uh, of driving change. Uh, we, of course, are known for our trends report. So we like trends, we like shifts, we like um, direction and transformation. I believe both individually, as a company, as a person, as in an industry, if you're not shifting and changing all the time, you're standing still. And I don't care for standing still yeah. <laughs> at all. Yeah, absolutely. The old body in motion stays in motion, right? So Absolutely, yep. So thanks for the insight with the, with the name there. We had Thad Wong on, uh, an influencer with At Properties. Uh, yes. And uh, we asked him the same thing because At, you know, like the, the symbol is, is so unique. And I asked him what went into that. So uh, appreciate that. But uh, let's carry on. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, you got you mentioned trends and you, re -mentioned, you mentioned reports. You guys, um, you know, I remember actually the first time I had ever heard of, of your company was the danger report. You guys oh, yeah. provide, you know, various reports and information out there to agents, to brokerages. And um, so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your reports, you guys come up with, you know, you, you rank the top, you know, 200 most influential people in real estate, top franchises by volume, transactions, you know, a lot of statistical analysis. And I mean, talk to me about how, you know, how much staff, how much manpower is behind this, because, you know, one of these reports, white papers, they're, they're thick, they're, they're well put together. I got to imagine the amount of research that goes into it is, is, is just overwhelming to think about, honestly. Uh, we, we do have people uh, on staff, employees that uh, work on research all the time, full time. Um, we do, of course, have uh, specific uh, drives or pushes where we do research in certain periods of the time, which I will discuss momentarily. Uh, I would say, uh, Michael, that we probably put our information, mm, let's say three buckets if I had to think about it quickly. The one bucket is the research which we do on our own for ourselves largely, and we, we author, research, analyze, uh, design, edit, publish everything. So from start to finish, uh, is 100% us. That would be things like, for argument's sake, uh, the Swanepoel Trends Report, right? Now in 15 years, average about 220 pages per year, doesn't carry outside advertising. I mean, we don't, we, it's not a product which carries a promotion or endorsement. It is um, uh, probably- I'm sure you've been asked that though, right? I'm sure you've been approached, you yeah. know? Yeah, well, I've been offered a, a nice high five figure number for the back cover. Yeah, and Very tempting, very tempting. I mean, I'd love to, to you know, pay my son's college tuition. But, but sure. at the same time, we are very scared and fearful that if we take on advertising in certain publications, such as that one, there might be a perception that we're, we're benefiting that company above another. Sure. And, and we don't. We honestly don't. So we are scared not to, not to do that. The trends report, you know, takes um, 600 to 800 hours of research and writing. It takes us the best part of about four months. We usually start at around about July, August and then it gets published the first week of December. Uh, it usually has 10 chapters, 10 trends, 
each trend, each chapter is autonomous from the other. You, you don't have to read them contiguously. You can read them in any order you want to. We do, do the, the book is very unique that it starts at chapter 10 and then goes 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, like a letterman list. So the last chapter of the book is chapter one. And the reason for that is we actually start at what we think is the 10th most significant trend and we work down to the most significant okay. trend of number one. Okay. Um, they like, David, are written, like David Letterman's top 10 yeah, you mentioned. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, we usually pick a, a concept, a business model, um, rather than a company. We do sometimes uh, feature a company. Uh, it is never ever on their request. It's not because they asked. It's when you get some big companies, whether it is a, a NAR or a Keller Williams or a Compass, when you get some of those big companies, which they become almost a, a weather pattern on their own, right? They're so significant because of something they've done. They've, they've raised a huge amount of money. They've grown disproportionately in size. They've become the biggest or whatever. Then mm -hmm. you would look at that and say, well, I can feature somebody else, but these guys are really, they're the model, they're, they're, they're it. So we don't, we don't do it as a promotion. Um, they are not given any opportunity to, to uh, editorialize or edit the copy. We go to their offices uh, more than once and we do a deep, uh, we basically go look under the hood. <laughs> sure. What's there. And for us, everything that you spoke about on Inman or at a conference or put on a blog post, we're going to ask you that question. Show it. You know, you, you claimed it. So show it. We want to see it. We want to see that it works. So that, that's, uh, those are one bucket of our reports. The other bucket of our reports is when we do a little bit more focused, smaller, narrow, you called it a white paper, which is a good word. Um, when somebody says, could you go and do a, a, a research on commissions? Could you go do a research on the MLS? Could you go research on transaction management system? Where it's very laser focused, those reports, mm, 10, 20, 30 pages, maybe a tenth the size of a trend report. And we do those in 60 to 90 days. Very quick turnaround, very laser focused. And then the last category is we are usually the only choice in the industry when you want to write a industry-wide report. If you want to write, you mentioned the danger report. If you want to write a report, which is a six, nine, 12 month study of a, a totality of the MLS industry or the entire NAR or all brokerages or all, all franchises, uh, we are in most cases not uh, only the best choice, but probably <laughs> almost the only choice to do that. So hence when NAR wanted to do an analysis um, six years ago, the report was published five years ago. So we did the research about six years ago on what they called all of the uh, risks, all of the fears, all of the concerns. They specifically asked us not to do solutions. They said everybody should come up with their own solution, but could you help create us a list, like a checklist almost. Could right. you create us a list of all of the most significant dangers that are impacting all of the most important constituents in the industry. The brokers is a big important constituents, the agents, mm -hmm. right, including your luxury agents. So luxury agents are important constituents. Mm -hmm. uh, the association world, the MLS world. So we looked at each of those worlds and came up with um, multiple dangers. In the end, we trimmed them to 10, but we had, we had more at one stage. Interesting, yeah, so different perspective, right? Because there's so many moving parts in this industry. A lot of times on our live stream, Absolutely. we'll get consumers that aren't, you know, licensed agents or brokerages or franchisees. And, and you know, they're, they're learning and they're commenting and, and reaching out to saying, oh, interesting pers perspective. So, you know, we had Rebecca Jensen who runs MRED, the sixth largest MLS in the United States. We've had her on our show. We've had Teresa Kenny on with the Miami Association of Realtors, second largest uh, real estate board, you know, in North America. America behind Toronto. So just getting different perspectives on, you know, all the moving parts and, and you guys kind of have your fingers on all those moving parts. Yeah. So there's another good example. You, you, you quoted two well-known women in our industry, two very successful leaders in our space, female leaders in our space. And you, you wrote, referred to a, a ranking of their organizations. So we do that. We don't consider that uh, something which we really write we see that more as a as a as a, an analysis and a and a and a, and a compilation okay. um, to prevent people from claiming that they are something which they may or may not be. We do analyze the entire industry. Well, we think it's the entire industry, but we look at <coughs> excuse me. We look at at franchisors, independents, networks, uh, brokerage companies, MLSs, associations, state and local. Uh, we even look at leaders. We work at, look at women leaders. We look at men leaders. We look at technology leaders, association leaders, upcoming leaders, retiring leaders, oldest companies. So we, we have decided, oh, we look at technology vendors, front office, back office, 
a website portal, a CRM. So I think we've, I think we have, uh, I'm not even sure because it changes every year. I think we're now up to something like 90 different categories Jeez. that we, we try to find. It's not that we want to create lists for the sake of lists. It is more that you try to put like-minded people, organizations, types, companies, structures, definitions into the same bucket. You cannot compare a Realogy to an EXP, to an Inman News, to a Zillow. Those are completely fundamentally different organization structures, both, both who they serve, what they do, what their charter is, their size, whether they're public. So what we try and do is we try and put them in the commonality of where it makes sense to compare them. And then we do a deep dive on each one of them and analyze them, not, not to critique them, not to praise them, but to find out what happened in the last 12 months. So we'll look at a calendar year, January 1, December 31st, and we will look at what was your sales volume, how many transactions did you do, how many agent count did you have, if you are a, a, an association, how many members did you have, how much did you grow, if you raised money, how much money did you raise, if you're a public company, what was your stock price, what was your market capitalization, what was the low, what was the high, so we look at different criteria in each of these buckets. If you're a technology company, how long have you been in business? How many clients do you have? How many do you serve? What is your customer rating on average? We'll actually do surveys to try and determine if you have negative reviews. So we'll try and pull that information together. We don't publish all of the information because sometimes we are given access to confidential or private information. Sure. And sure. we will respect information which has been given to us in confidence. But a lot of the information which we receive is either general information, it's public information, it's not secretive information. And then we'll aggregate that onto multiple, dare I say, charts or tables or lists. Again, it's, it's not about the list. It is if you, Michael, or any of the people on your call, if you really want to know your industry, if you want to know the market of luxury or of franchising or of technology, you want data and you want clean, neutral, objective data that is not colored in by a press release <laughs> you know you we can unfortunately not believe press releases generally speaking right you, you get a press release and we all know that that it's exaggerated we know that they pick only the facts that flavor them for the day sure. right so so we try and call those and then we put those together in these in these uh, rankings in january we always release the top 200 most influential and powerful executives leaders women technologists and associates the people in February, we focus on what we call organized real estate, the, the local realtor association, the state association, the, the MLS association. We look at all of those. In March, we do the deep dive into technology. Again, uh, front office, sales office, back office, franchising software, independent software, accounting software, lead generation software, transaction management software, electronic signature software. We look at, I think there's 63 categories just in the technology world. Yeah. And then in, in March, uh, that was March and April, we jump into all the, what we call enterprise companies, the public companies, the relocation networks, the referral networks, the realty alliances, the leading REs, the public companies, the franchisors, any of those, the, the Christie's, the Sotheby's, any of those big organizations which have memberships, we, we look at those. And then in May, we jump into the brokerage companies and we analyze out of the 86,000 brokerage companies, who's the top thousand based on either transaction count, sales volume, or agent count. And then in this month, which we're busy with now, which is coming out, your call is actually fortuitous, it's coming out in about ooh, two weeks, three weeks time. Um, we pull all of those lists together and we do a print publication. It's like, I don't want to say a Bible because Bible has a religious connotation, but it's, it's a, a compendium like 450 page monster, which is the kind of thing which you want to keep on your table because it's the reference guide of everything be real estate for the year 2019. Awesome, man. That's just the, the amount of various lists and the amount of research. It's, it, it's quite impressive. And I've seen those reports. Uh, so that's why I'm having you on because I've been so impressed. So let's, let's kind of shift gears a little bit, if you would. Um, you know, obviously, we're, we're during an unprecedented time right now with COVID-19. And you guys do some consulting for large franchises, independents, brokerages. You know, talk to me a little bit about, you know, the, the common questions you're getting or what advice you're giving to, you know, to these there's so many unknowns, right? I mean, 40 million people under, you know, unemployment. And, and so specifically, you know, what, what are you seeing and what are your clients looking for from you guys um, that maybe they weren't looking from your company and, and, and your staff pre COVID-19? Good, good. Very far reaching, far reaching question, Michael. Thank you. 
Um, it has shifted. Uh, I think that in February and mainly in March, maybe a little bit in April, most of the focus was on what does it mean? What is the act? What, how do I get financial support? Am I going to make it through? How do I file applications? Where can I cut corners? Where can I cut finances? Do I trust a team? Do I furlough a team? Do I keep my team? How do I keep my team spirits above? Um, so I think it was, it was very focused on the, the here and the now. It was the very immediate kind of stuff. And you could sense there was, for most people, not really, when you're a leader, you don't really get scared. So it's not fear, but it is concern. It is, it is worry. It is, uh, am I taking the right decision? Am I making the right uh, decisions for, for, of course, for myself, but for my, for my partners, for my, for my staff, for my family, for my company, for my agents, for my consumers. So you, you, know, you, you first start close to you and then, and then you branch out and, and your concern gets wider and wider and wider and wider. And you're trying to do the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. I think that around about um, end of April, I think most people could see the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. It, it might be that in your area or even nationwide, the numbers were still clicking up, but I think we had already digested the politics of this and the announcements and the two sides of the party and the different stories and the international numbers. And, and, and we were all somehow almost, we were almost zoomed out, right? We'd almost heard enough about CNN and Fox and MSBSN and, and international in China and Italy. And we got to a stage where we go like, yeah, can, can this just be over? And I think that somewhere towards the end of April, uh, people started saying, so what am I going to do when this is all over? Whether being over is maybe you know now, maybe, maybe June, maybe it's only July, maybe it's August, doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but what am I gonna do when it's over? And how do I make sure that I come out of this hitting, you know, hitting for the fences? How do I come out of this doing the right thing. So I think a lot of people in, in, in April and, and May started focusing on business plan revision, um, a re-kickstart goal. Um, can I recover in Q3 to make up for Q2? Or am I going to take Q3 and Q4 and Q1 next year to week for Q1? Um, I understand that I'm going to be a little bit down this year, but you know it's not going to be 30%, which I thought it was going to be. Maybe it's down it's only 5 or 10% for the entire year. Um, so I think there was a, a refocus in mindset. If you then look towards the end of May, beginning of June, where we are now, people are actually already starting to see a turn in the market, right? They're starting to see that, that showings are, are, are increasing, uh, open houses are increasing, um, offers on listings are increasing. In some cases, even multiple offers on houses are, have come back. Mm -hmm. And although we're not quite back where we were maybe uh, before, because January and February was, was great. I mean, most of us had a great January and February. And, and yes, uh, uh, April sucked. I mean, April was terrible, but we had another focus. May is starting to show signs of recovery. June is definitely, definitely better in many cases than same, same time last year. So it's interesting how pent up demand seems to have created a little bit of a, a nudge. It's not that it's not flying off the handle. It's not, it's not you know, thousands of percent better, but, you know, uh, we've looked at, I don't know, 20 markets, and it's surprising that every now and then we see 105%, 107%, 110%, better than same time, same store, same market last year. Of course, it's, it's maybe, you know, 50% better than May, but if you try and compare apples with apples, you know, it's, it's somewhere between 90% to 110% of same store, same time, same market last year. And that's very encouraging. That is encouraging. So, I think that we are in for a, uh, as, as June wraps up Q2, uh, of course, Q2 is going to be bad with, with April and May, especially with May, but, but I think Q3 is actually going to look good. I think we have all signs that we will overcome most of the struggles of COVID to a level where most people are starting to feel comfortable to go back to normalcy, whatever that may mean for you. Of course, regrettably, the, the political um, situation and, and the protesting, and of course, in some, in some cases, the rioting, um, are unexpected from a COVID point of view, and it's now coming in and it's now screwing with the numbers a little bit, right? Because now we have, a, we have another pandemic on its own kind, right? Sure. So we have, we have two dissimilar things now sort of merging with each other whilst we're actually trying to get into summer holiday and peak yeah. season. 
So uh, numbers can be interpreted by many people in different ways. It's hard to tell. But if I'm if I had to be a betting man, um, I would say we're going to have a good Q3. We're going to have a strong Q4, despite the fact that we'll go into seasonal adjustment in December. But we'll have a strong Q4. So I think this year will have its emotional lows. But I think business-wise, we are going to come out um, alive. And we are going to come out shooting very well. We are going to come out strong. Maybe not quite where we would have liked to have been did we not have riots and COVID. If we did not have those two, we would have maybe been, last year the country did 5.34 million transactions, right? Existing homes, not new construction. 5.3. Uh, originally, we were all thinking maybe this might be a 5.5 year or 5.6 year. Some people said a 5.8 year, but let's say 5.3 to 5.6. We thought that we might now drop down to maybe a four and a quarter, four and a half. I think most people are now saying maybe four and a three quarter. So they're saying 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, somewhere in that ballpark, which means that we might be down for the year based on current stuff, of course. A big riot can change that. Sure. COVID wave, wave two can change that. But we might only be down for the year 10% nationwide. And that's not bad. That's not bad at all. That, that's not bad at all. And give, give us some kind of context. The 5.34 um, million transactions last year. Uh, how does that compare to a, you know, a, a, you know, over the last three or four years? I mean, what, what, what does that look like? It's a strong year. It's a strong year. Um, we, we could, if you wanted to, to draw lines, you know, the, I mean, the very broad lines, you would say that it, uh, under four, it doesn't happen. In the fours is disastrous. Uh, sevens is heaven. Uh, very strong is sixes. A okay. good year is fives. So, so uh, of course, higher fives is better than lower fives. Sure. But if you wanted round numbers. Um, yeah, that's simple right there. Fives, fives is a, fives is a, five is a nice number. Six, of course, is better, but five is a nice number. Okay. We, we can all make good money on, on a five something million transaction year in this country for resale. Yeah, but back, you know, in the valley, if you will, 07, 08, you know, approximate, what, 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 where were we looking at? Three and a half, four million transactions back, you know, on those? Yeah, down to four. Okay. Down to four for the nation. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, all right. Last couple questions I have for you. Thank you. Wealth well, we of just knowledge. Got I thought we were going to go for three hours. <laughs> well, we could, we could. Um, so, you know, you guys, you know, pivoted a little bit, right? And you created this Fireside Fridays. Uh, to talk to me a little bit about that. You're bringing in industry experts, you know, franchise leaders of CEOs of franchise. Uh, you know, recently you, you had uh, both Josh Team, I believe, on and uh, Gary Keller. Uh, I think uh, Sherry Chris I saw is in the lineup. T talk to me a little bit about Fireside Fridays. A, uh, what went into launching that, and B, uh, just, you know, you know, B. I guess tell us a little bit about what what's the vision of that. Um, I'm going to take one step back and say Fireside Friday is actually one fifth of a bigger picture. Okay. And I will I will frame it by saying that when this news started slightly going south. In, in February and really hit us in reality in March, mm -hmm. uh, we as a leadership uh, took a step back and said, okay, what can we do for the industry? Our, our, we don't serve clients. I mean, uh, we don't serve customers, meaning uh, uh, consumers. We don't serve consumers. We are a, a B2B business. So, so our current customers are, are franchisors, associations, MLSs, brokers, teams. Those are our kind of customers. So we said, how can we serve them? And we came up with five ideas and we decided to launch them for every day of the week. And Friday Firesides was our Friday initiative where we said we would speak to different leaders of the industry. Um, in most cases, the CEO, president, C-level kind of an executive. And it would be a, a, a non-commercial, um, it's also not an inquisition. We didn't try to put the people in a box. It was just, it was a casual chat. It was, hi, Sherry, hi, Ryan, hi, hi Josh. Um, Tell me how you've been experiencing, you know, the last couple of weeks and what you have in, in the pipeline. We did that on Thursdays, what we called uh, so social Thursdays, where we did that for associations and MLSs. We got specifically association executives together, put in most cases two or three of them on a panel, and we discussed executive leadership things that applied to associations. So again, it was, it was very, very targeted. Um, 
on Tuesdays, we did tactical Tuesdays and we did that specifically for brokers and agents. And we said, what do you have to do this week? Not big picture, not high strategy. Now, what do you have to do now? And we would get top producers and agents in to do that. And we had that discussion on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, we actually gave all of the other three sessions. We did a summary and we did documents and we gave free handouts and guides. So we would every week give out a one pager, two pager, three pager, four pager, how to cut costs in your company, how to recruit agents in a down market, um, how to keep your team lifted up in spirits, how to arrange a Zoom meeting. So those were things that we gave practical downloadable things which everybody could just download for free. And then on Monday, we decided we were gonna give free consulting. So we created what we called Ask T3. And we said that we would um, consult for no charge to 60 companies per month at no charge. You could call us with any problem that you had. And for the month of um, April and May, uh, we, we created a new URL, a new email. We dedicated one staff member to that, one of our senior vice presidents. I think you actually know her, Kelly. We yes. dedicated Kelly to that. She was the point person, but she didn't handle just the uh, HR. She, she handled not just recruiting. She could handle any question. And if she couldn't handle it, she would revert back to one of us. And um, we gave out free consulting, of course, Zoom-wise over the phone. But we did that for many companies, many companies. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we're talking about adapting, bringing value, staying relative. You know, I'm friends with a, an attorney online. Uh, went, we went to high school with, and I saw him post something yesterday on LinkedIn that their firm is 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 giving um, hours, attorney hours, for nonprofits um, during this difficult time with the riots and, and race relations, and very similar. Giving back, right? Giving back, um, and that's you know. You know, compliments to you and that's kind of how we launched this as well we like i said in the beginning you know our first show was april 10th it took us you know a couple of weeks to line some people up and we we launched on april 10th but the same concept of what you guys are doing right is bring value let's you know let's raise let's raise the bar and um, you know so kudos to you and uh, your philosophy thank you for for think, all of that yeah i think we had 62 if i remember the number 62 companies which were not our clients reach out to us and ask us if we could provide them some, some guidance, some information, some best practices, uh, some uh, steps on how to do something. You know, they would say, this is, this is our challenge. And of course, every client was confidential. So we, we try and never discuss clients' names, even, sure. even in an example. So, but a, a brokerage company would call and, and say, here's my dilemma. I, I, I need to recruit agents, or I was busy recruiting agents, or I have a threat that agents are gonna leave me uh, is there a way in which I can uh, overcome that problem? We'd say, oh yeah, here's best practices. There's four solutions that you can do. And here they are, and we'll send it to you immediately. So uh, yeah, try to help those companies which were most in need. Yeah, and, and that's that's an abundance mindset right there. And and so I try to teach brokerages and agents that same concept, right? The best, you know, if you lead with a giving hand, there's so many uh, positive residual effects to that, right? So you, you have 62 uh, in this example, companies, brokerages, franchises that, that reached out. You guys, no strings attached, provide great content, guidance, and, you know, when the time comes to return to favor, if they need to refer someone or reach back out to you, they're going to remember you. And that's a great, um, you know, it's called reciprocity, right? Um, provide something of value and expect nothing in return. But if you do what you say you're going to do, you're going to get some amazing uh, results. Uh, and that's the catch. You just gave it, you gave the golden thread there. Don't expect something back in return. Correct. Of course, I understand that all of us would like something back in return. I get that. But, but the second you expect it back, then you're no longer giving it from the heart. Right. Now it's coming, as you said, with strings attached. You've right. got to give it, you've got to do good to somebody where you have no win from that doing good. The good has to be one way to somebody else and let them get whatever good they can out of it without asking. Don't even ask for something back. I believe also like you in the abundance mentality, you will get back one day. It might be from somebody else on a different circumstance, for something totally different. But but whether that something else happens or not, it doesn't matter. You still got to give. Still got to give. Yeah. No, I, I, absolutely. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, uh, this is a one or two uh, word answer. We've been asking most of our guests this. But in your <clears throat> okay. Opinion, you know, when, you, when, 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 in your opinion, when shelter in place and most every state's a little bit different, but when things, I guess, go back to normal and 
um, and agents and the agents and the teams that will thrive most. Uh, and again, I know you don't work with individual agents, but in your opinion, based on talking to franchisers and you know team leaders, broker owners, the agents and offices and teams that will thrive most will have blank in common. Fill in that blank. Will have blank in common. Focus and determination. Focus and determination. Awesome. All right. So tell us what's the best uh, place. Uh, Stefan, that people can find out more information about T3 and, and you and uh, or perhaps even find out more information if they want to see a replay of, of one of the fire, uh, you know, Fireside um, Fridays. Yep, yep. So thank you. Um, I, I sometimes hard to answer the question because we have many websites. I think we have something like about two dozen, something like about 20 different <laughs> ones. Because we do create for every every book or project of significance like the Danger Report or the Trends Report um, or the Real Estate Almanac, they all have their own dedicated website, which just serves that version. So that if you if you wanted, let's say, to see the rankings of anything in the country, doesn't matter what it is, associations, people, companies, whatever, you would go to realestatealmanac.com. But there is nothing about T3 services on that website. It is just purely realestatealmanac.com. If you wanted to go to the danger report, you would go to dangerreport.com. So we generally get domains that are very clear, very simple. They're always .com. Uh, we generally don't use hyphens or misspellings or anything. But if you ask for our corporate site, our company's name is, is T360. And we have that either T3 and then spelled out S-I-X-T-Y or T360.com. So we have all the variations of that. So you can just go T360.com and that'll give you a sort of the, the corporate holding site. That's not a sales site. It doesn't, it doesn't promote any product, but it does on a high level explain who we are, what we are, what the buckets are, who the people are, who heads up the different divisions, what the different divisions are. It's, it's sort of a kind of a little bit more of a kind of a corporate site. That's awesome. And we'll make sure we put that URL in the, in the oh, replays. Thank you. Um, so uh, that, that's great. Uh, again, we're doing an online uh, luxury designation uh, training coming up in July, and we bought a URL just for that, and we try to make it really simple as well. So well, uh, you've, done, you've done a good job with luxury. It is, it, it's, it's a market that's always been around, but it's maybe a market that hasn't always quite really been understood and, and maybe sometimes um, maybe under, under uh, appreciated. So uh, I am aware of some of your stuff. You've, you've created a council, you've created a designation. Now you've written a book about it. So kudos to you to you. Um, stepping up and, and doing something for not just yourself, but for the, for the space, for the industry, for the luxury space. Well, thank you. Yeah, we try to provide great resources and, and, and information for both agents, but also for the consumers, right? Because if you have a good friend or a relative and they have a, an executive type property and they hire a friend from the country club, we want that friend that's a part-time agent to have the tools and the resources to be successful because if they're not successful, that hurts us as an industry. So that's kind of always been our philosophy and that's why we don't have any prerequisite you know, requirements if somebody wants to take our course. Yep, yep, yep. I, I, um, I feel the weight <laughs> uh, of the industry on my shoulders every day. <clears throat> I do not know why. <laughs> and, and for some reason, I, I feel I'm the father of the industry. And of course, I am not. I understand that I'm not. And, and the industry's mistakes are, are not mine. And they're not mine to fix. And I shouldn't put my nose where it doesn't fit. I get that. But, but I feel so uh, responsible for all of the agents and all of the brokers companies, all of the franchises. And I, I, I really so much want the industry to, as an industry collectively succeed and, and not as an industry, screw it up <laughs> or mm -hmm. get it wrong or make mistakes. And again, any industry of course is broken up into many, 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 many small pieces. And, and we, our industry, I, I've said it many times, our industry has <clears throat> some of the best people in, in the world in the space. But unfortunately, we also have some of the biggest assholes in our space as well. Yeah. We, we have all of them in our space and, 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 and we have to live with that. But, but we want to, as a collective, do the best we can for the industry and thereby serve the consumer the best way we possibly can. And, and I think that as a whole, we actually do a very, very good job. Clearly, there are places where we can improve. As, as we all know, we can do that. We can always improve everywhere, right? Sure. We're not perfect by any stretch. And, you know, the industry gets sued all the time <laughs> and brokers get sued all the time. But as a whole, I think most agents try to do their best. And yeah. most agents actually do a, a good job. A good job. Yeah. 
with that, there's not much to add to that. <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much. Uh, have a great rest of your Wednesday. And uh, for those uh, that are watching, again, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, keep raising the bar, make somebody's day, you know, reach out to a friend. There's just so much out there and uh, more love out there. So with that being said, Michael Lafito, have a great Wednesday. Until next time, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Take Stefan. care, everyone. All right, Cheers. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.